Okay, hello everyone. This video is going to be about Jeffrey McDonald. And before I start, I'm going to check with my, my uh, folks here to let me know whether you can see and hear me and um, if I'm pixelated. <laughs> uh, so, my son was over here uh, working for two hours on uh, technical issues and I don't know what he did to my, my uh, you know, to my computer. Oh, you can see and hear me. Do I look like this? <laughs> we can hear you. Okay, can you see me? Hey, no, hearing is not enough. We got to be able to see me. Can you see me? No pixels. All right, good. Because last time it was kind of a mess. Anyway, oh, cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, there's there there there's somebody who's clarifying things. Joe says no technical issues so far. <clears throat> yeah, you're right about that. Uh, <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, but anyway, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, I want to let everybody know who is coming here to see this video later. And they're like, why didn't I know the live was on at three o'clock? I missed it. Why did I miss it? Okay. You missed it because I have made the live portion pat pat Patreon only. And uh, the reason I've done so is because of bots and, and, uh, and uh, haters and trolls and people who have agendas and this case oh my god you either for jeffrey mcdonald or you think he's totally innocent and if you don't agree with me or even if you do whatever you're just going to come in and you're going to ignore what i say and you're just going to go for your agenda and you're going to take over the chat room i was done with that so now i have a pleasant chat room with these wonderful people i've got ryan and annie and steve and benny and let's see who else is here i've got molly and Martin and Christine and let's see who else is here. I'm going down my list here. Joe and 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 Lisa and Carrie and I'm gonna go keep going. Martin's here and okay. I think this is. I think I'm running to the end here. Okay, if I didn't say your name, I really am sorry. Uh, but these are all folks who've joined Patreon um, and are here because I like the channel. And therefore, I know they're going to be um, a great group in the chat room. Um, and don't worry, even if you don't want to join Patreon, um, you can still see every single one of my videos. You can. They're all open to the public. Just the live part is going to be open to Patreon. And if you're wondering how that works, uh, let me just show you for a sec here. Um, that would be that would be right here this is patreon uh you go to, and the link is below you just go to patreon i have five levels uh level three four and five are the ones that can join in with the live sessions um the lowest level three level three is just five bucks a month to support the channel keep the content coming and join in the lives but you know you're not required to do that hey just subscribe i still love you <laughs> buy a book okay that's what i want to say about that so I just want to let you know why, if you thought you couldn't get into the live today, that's why. Okay, so now let's get on to this really, really interesting case. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. All right, now, this is the case of Jeffrey McDonald. And this is probably, oh, well, we've got some more Doreen is here now too. Hi, Doreen. Um, and Elizabeth is here. Hi, Elizabeth. Oh my gosh, hold on a second. My nose is running. <sighs> Mm, okay, then. Uh, I wish I had, why don't I have Kleenex? <laughs> oh, yeah, my toilet paper's in the bathroom. Okay, so anyway, um, this is a fascinating case. I'm going to, I will read you the super quick Wikipedia bit first, um, in case you have no idea about this case. This is the one, one of the most, well, it is the most heavily litigated case in the United States for a homicide. It's insane. It's gone on for years and years and years, and people are still fascinated with it and I'm going to tell you why in a minute but let me just read you the basic just so if you have no clue who Jeffrey McDonald is especially if you're not a uh, you know, U.S. person you may have no clue because you know we don't tend to know other countries big cases like we do our our own so anyway here we go uh, Jeffrey McDonald was a, an American former medical doctor and U.S. United States Army captain who was convicted in August of 1979. So that's, that's been a long time. And yet it's still a case that fascinates people um, of murdering his pregnant wife and two daughters 
in February of 1970. Um, so, yeah, 1970 was when he was uh, actually, so it's actually a 50-year-old case. Um, 1979 is when he finally got convicted, nine years after it happened. Um, so 1970 is when it, when it happened, and he was serving at that time as an Army Special Forces physician. McDonald has always proclaimed his innocence of the murders, which he claims were committed by four intruders, and later he says, or maybe more, um, three male and one female, who had entered the unlocked rear door of his apartment at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and attacked him, his wife, and his children with instruments such as knives, clubs, and ice picks. Prosecutors and appellate courts have pointed to strong physical evidence attesting to his guilt. He is currently incarcerated at the Federal Correctional Institution in Cumberland, Maryland, which is my state. Oh, great. I can go visit him. Um, uh, the McDonald murder case remains one of the most litigated murder cases in American criminal history. All right. So now, basically, it's just like this. He was a person with no criminal record. Uh, he was a uh, seem seemingly well-liked human being. He was a doctor. He had been a Green Beret. I mean, everybody liked him. Even his uh, in-laws liked him. Everybody seemed to like him. Um, and then one day, his whole family gets murdered in his house. And the problem is that the physical evidence is, shall I say, overwhelming in that there were no intruders and that only one person was involved. Uh, and let me just st start right here. I'm going to say right up front, yes, I think he's guilty. Okay, so if you don't think he's guilty and you're all mad at me now, uh, you stay around and see what I have to say. Um, but the, the reason for this particular show is not about whether he's innocent or guilty, but what was the fatal flaw? That's why I named it Fatal Flaw. What was the fatal flaw that could drive this man, who had everything going for him, with this beautiful family, what could have driven him to this kind of thing? Why would he do such a thing? Now, you can still think he's innocent if you want to, and I'm going to point out a lot of uh, information during the show, evidence which I think supports his guilt. Um, I'm going to not lean heavy on the physical evidence because that is so well explained almost every place else. I'm going to also talk about things that his uh, explanation of the crime and other things that occurred in his life before and after the crime, which lead me to believe that he's guilty. So I'm going to start with that. <laughs> there's, some, there's some people say, I say <laughs> oh, that's not welcome, Diana. That's why I was looking for Doreen. Yeah, I think he's guilty too. And uh, Kyrie says, I think, oh, I don't know. Wait a minute. I don't know what point she's talking about. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Okay, so, but I want to explain more of this. And so I'm not going to leave you completely without having any knowledge of what happened. But I just, this is, there's so many YouTube channels, there's so many books, there's so many movies on this case explaining every shred of the physical evidence that I'm not going to repeat everything everybody else has already said. Having said that, I want to start with this, okay? All right. Are you ready? All right. Now, I want you to hear this at the beginning of the show. Hold on a second, I need a drink because it's a little long here. All right. Welcome, Diana. Listen to this. Remember, just, just to let you, just remember this. The murders were committed in 1970. In 1970, February of 1970, this man, his entire family, was brutally murdered with one of the most, one of the most brutal crimes I've, I've ever seen as a, in, a, in a family being annihilated. I mean, we're talking about massive stab wounds, bludgeoning with a, with a, with a wood stick. We're talking about ice picks. We're talking about knives. We're talking about children being murdered. The worst you could ever imagine. Now, let's assume this guy is innocent. Because um, we, should, we should do that. Let's think he's innocent. Just two years ago, this is horrible, horrible thing has happened to him. This, this woman, he knew her since, she, uh, I think, uh, junior high. They dated really early in junior high, then they broke up, then they dated in college, and then they got married. She did get pregnant, but they got married, and, and they went on with their lives, and they had these two beautiful girls, and she was pregnant with his son. And he just bought these girls a pony for Christmas. You know, um, everything looks so incredible, and you would think he has the best life ever. Now imagine, he's innocent. He's absolutely innocent. He has this wonderful life. He's reached this point where he's actually making good money. They're looking to forward 
to their future. Everything's great. Ninth, February of 1970. Now, oh, let me put this up for, let me say this first. Um, there's a number of books written and this, this book, um, the book, the book I got this from is the Joe McGinnis book, um, linked below. I think I linked it below. Yes. Uh, a, a fatal vision, which the movie was made on, by the way, one of the best books I've ever read for true crime. I'm not a fat fan of a lot of true crime fiction, which I think is, you know, either agenda driven or money driven or gory driven. And this was a brilliant journalist book totally approved um and the movie ha huh, wow i don't you know go for many of these movies fatal vision fabulous movie so what so read the book it's long but read the book and also watch the movie so anyway now you ready for this okay two years after the crime pay attention i'm going to read from the book these are the words of of Jeffrey McDonald. This is not, this is coming out. I believe he tape recorded things, but, or wrote them, but this, these are his exact words. This isn't Joe McGinnis messing around with the words. You know what I'm saying? Because sometimes authors will, you know, cheat and edit and stuff like that, like TV. This is not, these are his words, his words. Two years after the murders in 1970, pay attention. 72 and 73 were really the fun times. They were the very good years. I was beginning to put my life together, back together. Okay. I was becoming a successful doctor and the rest of my life was made up of boating and working out and seeing joy. We had a really tremendous relationship, both socially and emotionally and certainly sexually. She being the most sensual woman I had ever seen and me becoming very successful professionally. Joy was this gorgeous receptionist who worked for one of the yacht dealers in the area. And I remember very clearly the first time I saw her. She had a camel colored suit and she looked very prim and proper, had her hair up and there was no real hint except in her eyes of this incredible beauty and tremendous sensuality that was to unfold. But I remember I walked into the showroom and she looked at me and did a double take. And I looked at her and did a double take. And she stared at me and I stared at her. And basically our fates were sealed from that moment on as silly and romantic as it sounded. And it goes on. All trips, all of the, my medical meetings that I went to, I always brought joy. We did a lot of trips to Las Vegas, some trips to Lake Tahoe and a lot of meetings and medical meetings. We had some unbelievable vacations. I took her to Tahiti. As a matter of fact, um, oh, and I told her, asked her what she wanted for Christmas. I guess it wasn't a pony. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> um, and she said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh. <laughs> I messed up my broadcasting. <laughs> now I'm going to laugh. <laughs> shouldn't want a pony. Uh, anyway, she said she just wanted a nice dinner somewhere. And I told her, well, I'll tell you what, instead of for Christmas, I'll give you a pony. <laughs> no pony. Her birthday is December 9th. I told her that for, for her birthday before Christmas, I would take her out to dinner to the restaurant of her choice. And then it goes on about oh, thinking of all the fine restaurants, blah, blah, blah. And then he says, oh, I forget it. Why don't I just take you to Tahiti? I mean, this is this this boyfriend. I'm looking for this dude. Kind of going to take me to Tahiti instead of a, a crappy, you know, local restaurant in Tahiti. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> there's there's some points here. Uh, Steve says, "Oh wait, um, Steve, he's talking about a love as he's, if he's a lovesick schoolboy again, instead of having lost his wife and children. You think?" Oh my goodness. Uh, 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 <laughs> well, that's it. He's overdosed on joy and madness pursued. Oh my God. <laughs> Pat's got the giggles that'll add another 20 minutes to the live stream. It may. Okay, I'm going to control myself. <clears throat> but it is funny. We had 10 days on on Tahiti, three days on Bora Bora, and seven days on another island. That was a fantastic vacation. 
Oh, I'm glad for you, dude, because you know your wife and children are dead. Um, okay, sorry, I had to interject. Okay, I'd say by the spring of 72, Joy and I were, you know, really getting it on, so to speak. To use a lousy California expression. You just had to use it, didn't you, <clears throat> Jeffrey? Okay, yeah, okay, let's go on because, you know, one of the things you're going to find about Jeffrey, I'm going to use a lot of these examples because I want you to get the point. He has an issue about sex. I mean, you know, this is a book about the murder of his wife and children. This is a book about supposedly him trying to save his own life and, and not go to prison, being, being wrongly accused. And he spends a lot of time on sex. And you're going to see this. Okay, here we go. When Joy and I were alone, making love was a large proportion of our time, including out in the sun on the top of the boat, on the engine hatch, <laughs> and down below on the bunk. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, dude, I mean, it's so bad. In every conceivable place in between. And we were sort of shameless. You know, it was shameless abandon. You know, you had time to think, Jeffrey, about putting this in a book. It's just like, we don't need to know where you had sex. We really don't need to know. Oh, my God. Okay. It's hard. It's hard to keep a straight face through this. I really, I was planning to keep a straight face, you know, just so you'd hear it like this, but I can't help myself. It was two sort of passionate people, neither of which had a very smooth life to that point. Oh, okay. So if you have a bad life and she had a bad life, oh, it's all about explosions when you meet and that past life put behind. Of course. Um, certainly mine have been much more tumultuous and traumatic. You think? What? Joy didn't have her family murdered brutally? Hmm. Okay. But it was two adults basically at play, trying to please each other and please ourselves, and we both understood that. We wanted to experience everything like as fast as we could. We always tried to do the most with the best, the flashiest, the most fun, the highest flight, and the longest trip, the deepest dive, and mmm, mmm. Actually, he does say mmm, mmm. I'm not making that up. This is not, I didn't add this in. Mmm, mmm. We had an absolutely fantastic sex life together. It was almost nonstop. It was Jesus, sometimes day or night. I'm not making this up. I can't believe I'm not making this up. We went to Las Vegas one time and made love at least five times. Didn't even really get to the casino that first night. And the next morning took right up where we left off. And finally realized we had to get up out of the room and see Vegas a little bit. And maybe, maybe catch the killers of my wife and two dead children. Well, he didn't say that. No, no, I did put that in. Okay, and we would stop. Uh, so, uh, and we would stop at noon and stop late in the afternoon, and then go out to dinner, and then come back and make love, and go out and gamble a little, come back and make love. There was a great need for a lot of release, a lot of immediate gratification. We did not, either of us, want to dwell in the past. Well, I guess not. We lived each day for that day with a little small bit of our eye on the future. But I wouldn't let myself admit openly and in repetitive fashion to her that I loved her. I wouldn't let her burrow into my soul, so to speak. <clears throat> so anyway, what Joe McGinnis goes on after this just, just to say, this is, not, this is not Jeffrey's words, these are McGinnis's words. His current lifestyle apparently involves working in an emergency room on the West Coast. He has a very nice apartment. He associates with attractive people attractive girlfriends. He has an expensive sports car. He has a large boat. And he apparently is leading a lifestyle entirely different from the kind of life he had when he was married. All right. Oh, that's just to point out, you know, that he had changed his lifestyle. Now, could he have just changed his lifestyle because, hey, you know, I went for this perfect life on the, eventually on the farm with a stupid pony and 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 this wonderful family but now that that's gone i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go all bonkers and be all you know you know get everything i can out of life in one day you know all the fancy things all the fancy women all the sex all whatever okay but i want to point out this one final thing he said here which i think is important uh, because this is about the attitude he has toward relationships and women somewhere along the way they asked him i believe this was in the courtroom do you remember where you worked in 1964? No, I'm sure you know. Well, when I mentioned Atlantic Construction, does that refresh your recollection with respect to Laura Talbot? 
Yeah, I think she was a secretary working there. Oh, and tell us what happened. I bawled the girl. Big deal, she was a secretary. I bawled the girl. Big deal, she was a secretary. Hmm. Well, you know. Okay, all right, so now, <clears throat> let's go to some more issues on the case. All right. <laughs> Steve says, he did save lives as a doctor in the emergency room. Such a tragic irony. Yeah, he did. Um, and this is, I, I, this is a great statement, actually. One of the problems we have when we're looking at, uh, you know, when a jury is looking at a case or the public is looking at a case is that we see the good things they've done. And we, because of the good things they've done, I mean, they've done good things. It doesn't mean they did them for a good reason. It's just good things they've done. We have trouble seeing that they could do bad things. Putting the two of them together just really, really rough for us. Um, so uh, if I take a look at, um, at uh, he has, Jeffrey McDonald has been uh, considered the like early version of Chris Watts. I have a video on Chris Watts. If you want to look through my playlist, my case files, Chris Watts. Good looking guy, beautiful wife, good looking kids. Two little girls, very similar. Has a per perfectly fine life. Does isn't a bad. Doesn't appear to be a bad person. Appears to be taking care of his family. Appears to be kind to his children. And then one day he offs all of them. We have trouble with that. Another one is um, Chris Coleman. Uh, he was Joyce Meyer's uh, bodyguard. I haven't done a, sh a thing on Chris Coleman yet, but very similar. He had actually wrote things on the wall mm -mm. in blood or in paint or whatever. He, I forgot what he used, but anyway. Something I got, wait, finally got you. Um, he's in prison. Um, he killed his wife and I think it was two sons. And he was considered a, a really nice guy because he was a bodyguard and theoretical Christian. And he um, he was like, worked with Little League and took his kids to the ball games. And so you have this nice, seemingly nice guy. And then all of a sudden he offs his family. Now, we know without a doubt, Chris Watts killed his family. We know without a doubt, Chris Coleman killed his family. Yet, there's still a lot of people cannot believe this guy killed his family. They just can't reconcile it with, he's the perfect guy. He was a doctor. He couldn't have done this. It's ridiculous. So, but you just heard what I read. Two years after he, um, his family was brutally murdered. The most fun years of his life. They were so much fun. I'm sorry, but you know, I still have trouble getting over, you know, other things in my life that, you know, they are sad and, you know, you work through them, but, you know, just to suddenly two years later say everything's so much fun, either you're a massive denial or you're a psychopath. One of those two things. Which one is it? <laughs> Red Rum comes in, says psychopaths live to be looked up to. They choose their jo jobs wisely. Packing, shipping, packing, shopping at checkouts doesn't do it. Now, this is going to be an interesting issue. We're going to talk about this a little later, uh, about um, why he was so immersed in these great jobs and doing all this work so hard. He worked overtime as a doctor. He worked like as many jobs as he could work, and that will come to play later. So, but I wanted to read you about how two years later, he was having fun and Bowling that joy, morning, noon, and night, you know, <laughs> having a great time. All right, so let's go to some of the issues of the case, just so I can set that up for you. Um, all right, now, for those of you who do not know about what happened that day, let me point out just a few basic things. Because um, I say I don't want to redo this case. You, 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 if you don't know much, you can just go read Fatal Vision. You can watch the movie Fatal Vision. Oh, and I want to tell you what not to... Well, you can watch it, but just just, just be careful. Because um, this is a... Uh, let's see if I'm going to find it here. Where did it go? Oh, yeah. All right. There are other shows about Jeffrey McDonald and other books. And one of the guys that read... did. Both the book and the show is a guy named Errol Morse. He did A Thin Blue Line, which was quite decent. At least I think I remember it being quite decent. Um, he's a filmmaker. He wrote a book. And he did a, he did a show called um, 
a wilderness of error, the trials of Jeffrey McDonald. I watched it all. I didn't link it below because I didn't like it. All right, I'm going to tell you why I didn't like it. I'm going to read from this website just so you understand there are varying opinions, but I have issues with the way some of them are presented. All right. Ten years after killing his, ten years after his pregnant wife and two young daughters were butchered in their home. You see how that's, that's listed? said, you know, they're already saying he's not doing it there. Ten years after his pregnant wife and two young daughters were butchered in their home in Fort Bragg, McDonald was convicted of the killings and sentenced to life in prison. While a jury was convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of McDonald's guilt, many people were still left with one lingering question. Did he really do it? The drama surrounding the heinous crimes and the subsequent trial fascinated the public for decades. It sparked controversial best-selling books, an immensely popular television miniseries, that was Fatal Vision, um, and an explosive 60 Minutes interview that was watched by 10 millions of viewers. Today, more than 40 years after the murders, uh, film make, uh, questions are still being raised about McDonald's guilt. No, no, no. They weren't being raised, really. This is called, uh, this is called Errol Morris, the filmmaker and, and author who sees money where he can see money. It's called Raise a Question, Open a Door, Confuse people, and, you know, you're, you're going to make some bucks. So he said, We've been sold a bill of goods about this case, said filmmaker Errol Morris. It's as phony as a $3 bill. No, it's not, Morris. You just want to make a buck. Morris, an Academy Award winning documentary director, blah, blah, blah. He said, The evidence is neither clear or convincing. Oh, it was massively convincing. And it was very clear. Um... There are many things about this case that rub me the wrong way. I bet they do. But principal among them is how the jury was asked to make decisions about his guilt or innocence with incomplete evidence. Evidence that was withheld, corrupted, and suppressed. This is a pack of lies. I just want to let you know. I, I don't agree with this guy, McGinnis. Tears him a new one. And his new, his, he has another book, McGinnis, called Final Vision. It's $2.99 on Amazon. And he is very upset about what this guy says. Basically, he tries to come up and say that these little pieces of evidence, uh, like a fiber or hair, that turned, that were either didn't come up with, you know, either anybody in the house being responsible for, is proof that it was, a, it was an, uh, somebody from outside coming in. Uh, of course, you know, they have many, many guests, so, you know, that's all ridiculous. Um, and the totality of the evidence, I always talk about totality. When you've got the massive amount of evidence you have against this guy, and then you point, oh, look, they didn't check this out. You know, okay, you know, it's probably meaningless, but you're going to make something of it. And that's what he did. Uh, and we're going to get talk about a little bit about Helena Stokely because he really pushes the Helena Stokely thing. And I'll tell you who she is in a second. All right. Flawed for forensic analysis, a contaminated crime scene, damaged and destroyed evidence, and an effort to bury a confession all contributed to a miscarriage of justice, according to Morris. All right. Was it a perfect crime scene handled? No, it was not. Um, was everything perfect? No, it was not. However, there's so much overwhelming evidence, you can say for the mistakes that might have been made, <laughs> this is one of, this is a case that you can pretty much say he did it. All right. What is not, oh, so uh, this has nagged me for years, Morris said, because I thought, you know, there's a buck to be made. I don't like Morris, you can see that. I felt I should do something. I bet you did. And you made your money. All right. What is not in dispute is what happened at 544 Castle Drive in the early mornings, hours of February 17th, 1970, at this location. All right. All right. This is on the base. Now, the base is an open base. Anybody can come and go. So it's not like, not like you have to go through a gate. So, yes, could the hippies that supposedly end up killing this family the four hippies, the five hippies, the six hip hippies, the 20 hippies, how many managed to fit in this apartment, uh, could have killed the family. Now, I want you to notice something here. Uh, first of all, you know, when you're picking a place to attack, probably going onto a base with military police and choosing a, a house that has a neighbor. As a matter of fact, this neighbor goes up the stairs and, and lives above. It is not really the brightest place to try to pick to get into. Now, supposedly they didn't go through the front door because it was locked. They supposedly went through the back door, which amazingly enough was unlocked. Okay. So they go in the back door. Really? Okay. All right. So this is not a likely place for them to choose. 
but supposedly this could have happened. All right. What is not disputed? All right. Military police officer, officers responding to a call from McDonald, all right, um, found his wife, Colette, beaten and stabbed to death in the master bedroom. True. The couple's two daughters, Kimberly, five, and Kristen, three, were in their beds, also stabbed to death. Also true. McDonald, who was wounded with two stab wounds, he had one clear stab wound to the abdomen, uh, looked, uh, and that collapsed his lung, which is, which is true, told investigators he was sleeping on the couch when he heard screaming. He said he awoke to find in his home three men and one woman, who he described as having blonde hair and wearing a floppy hat. They were chanting, kill the pigs and acids groovy before attacking him, McDonald told the investigators. McDonald and his claim of hippie killers made headlines around the country. They also turned him into a prime focus of the investigation. Yeah, because the story was ridiculous. All right. Um, the story is so bizarre and unlikely, it might actually be true. <laughs> Said senior, an senior legal analyst Jeffrey T Tubin. Really? <laughs> yeah, I might have a comment on Tubin. All right. It might be true. It's so crazy, it might be true. That is not how you do analysis. You don't say it's so crazy, it might be true. If it's so crazy, it most likely is not true. All right. It seems too preposterous on its face that a smart guy might have come up with something better, which raises the possibility it might actually be true. No, you don't understand. Even if you're a smart guy, you're not in, you know, you don't usually murder your family. So coming up with a concept for who else could have done it is not something you're really good at. So no, you could come up with this story, especially because you were reading the Esquire magazine, which was found in your living room, which had a whole thing about the Manson murders, which had happened just a few months previously. And it sounds just like the Manson murders. Where did you get that idea? Now, if you've watched enough of my videos, you will know that I've always pointed out that it's hard to come up with new, just a complete idea out of nowhere. You tend to look backwards. And that's a, that's a sign language thing. Look backwards. See it? See it? See it? Look forward, look backwards. Look backwards at something you are aware of. And so you might look back at a previous incident you have either seen or read. In this incident, hey, he looked look back on the Manson murders and thought, hey, this will work. You know, just because you're smart doesn't mean you're brilliant. Just because you're, just because you're smart being a doctor doesn't mean you're smart doing everything. All right, so let's see. Um, what is, certainly, what is absolutely certain is that a military inquiry into the murders recommended McDonald not be court-martialed, citing a lack of evidence. McDonald was granted an honorable discharge. There's a whole lot of reasons for this, and I'm not going to get into all because it's very, very complicated. That's why you read Fatal Vision. All right. He moved to Southern California where he practiced medicine, but the case against him was far from over. In 1975, a grand jury indicted McDonald for the murders. He was ultimately convicted in 1979 and sentenced to life in prison. He is almost the definition of an unlikely murder suspect, said Tubin. Princeton graduate, medical doctor, Green Beret, these are the kinds of credentials we associate with people at the top of the heap in this country, not convicted murderers. Yes, that is true. But when it comes down to a family annihilation, you'd be surprised at how some of these guys are actually quite well, you know, well-educated and have good jobs. So that's not exactly true, Tubin. Okay, let's see. Hmm. All right. Was McDonald the victim of injustice or a manipulative, cold-blooded killer? Fatal Vision, the 1983 book on the case by Joe McGinnis, portrayed McDonald as a cunning psychopath. Asked to comment on wilderness of error, McGinnis issued the following statement to CNN. And I'm with McGinnis. Jeffrey McDonald was convicted of the murders of his wife and two young daughters in 1979. In all the years since, every court that has considered the case including the United States Supreme Court, has upheld that verdict in every aspect. McDonald is guilty, not simply beyond a reasonable doubt, but beyond any doubt. All right, so it goes on to talk about this um, uh, a woman named Helena Stokely. A uh, key figure in Morris's bid to show McDonald's innocent is Helena Stokely, the woman who t confessed to being in the home the night of the murders. She confessed not in court. She confessed 
to, to some people. Then she said she didn't, wasn't there. Then she said she was there. Then she said she wasn't there. She, she, did a, she, she was full of crap. Okay. She was an attention seeker, full of crap. All right. Uh, she had a history of drug and alcohol abuse. A huge history. I mean, we're not talking about an occasional user. We're talking about a diehard junkie. All right. She died in 1983. Uh, testified that she had no involvement. She did. She testified that she had no involvement in the murders. Morris said she was encouraged by a prosecutor to alter her testimony. Now, what Morris doesn't tell you is that the defense spent a hell of a lot of time trying to force her to give testimony, saying she was there. You can't imagine how much they would do that. Oh, let me show you something. This is quite amusing. Okay, so the story of McDonald, Jeffrey gives, is that on that night, now he had, he had been home with the children. He had had a long shift. He'd been working many, many hours, many, way too many hours. And yet he was still awake and he comes home and he's, he's hanging out with the kids and his wife goes to a class and then his wife comes home and the kids put to bed and he and his wife sit around, have a drink, talk for a while. She goes to bed. He washes some dishes and then he goes to sleep on the sofa. Okay. And then he's woken up. He's woken up and, and, and then he's being attacked. You know, he's being attacked by three men and this, and this woman who over here is she's a woman who's got the stringy blonde hair, a hat, a ca some kind of floppy hat, and she's got the, a candle, which she, since it was raining outside, I don't think that makes a whole lot of sense, what she's carrying candles through the rain. Then he goes, oh, it could have been maybe a flashlight. Okay, anyway, she's saying kill the pigs and all that crap, standing around while three guys attack him with an ice pick and, a, and, 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 and bludgeon him, he says, with a, originally with a baseball bat, but we'll get to that. So this is the woman. So he says three men and this woman. Okay. Now what's really amusing about this, this is basically he gave a description, a white female, stringy blonde hair, a floppy hat and some white boots. All right. Okay. So this is Helena Stokely, the, the woman that ends up being a big pain in the butt because she did hang in the area. She had some issues and maybe he'd even seen her before and just mem remembered her and used her as an uh, as a description but the defense team jumps all over this so this is helena stokely without the the blonde wig now now look at the face of her and look at the face of her okay this is this is what's really amusing see her face see her round chin round chin see her eyes that are big eyes see her nose and mouth now look over here now, what do you notice here about the difference between this? This was a sketch done at the time. The defense apparently managed to come up with an artist to come up with this sketch. What do you notice about the sketch over here? <laughs> and Helena's, Helena Stokely. <laughs> I just thought this was hysterical. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to get your comments on that because I think it's just really, really funny. Um, isn't, that, isn't that like coincidental? that suddenly this photo, I mean, this sketch turns into this sketch. Now, you know, who's trying to, who's trying to pull one over on us? You know what I mean? Who's trying to pull one over on us? I mean, <laughs> you're trying to make it look like Helena Stokely. We know that it's just nonsense. So Helena Stokely is this crazy, crazy druggie that, you know, was in the area. And so they, they tried to make this a big deal. All right. The problem with this whole story is it doesn't hold water. <laughs> Doreen says the sketch on the right looks more like her to me. You think? Because by this time they already knew who Helena Stokely was. So then they drew the sketch based on exactly what she looked like. This is called manipulative fraud, you know, and, and that's what, you know, this kind of crap. See, this is the kind of crap you will find happening because people who are looking at this case and trying to learn about it will see this, this sketch and they'll go, well, oh my God, it was Helena Stokely. You can, how, it's absolutely Helena Stokely. How could anybody question that, you know, Jeffrey McDonald is, is innocent. It's clearly the woman that was, she was in the house. It's all nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. All right. So, and I'm going to get to this whole bit about the amphetamines. Yes. Oh, uh, this is true, Carrie. Uh, he was taking amphetamines. He, and the, the, there's a particular type he was taking and he also wrote that at this time, he was not tested for the drug. And I want to point something out about that, okay? People don't understand this. After the crime, he was tested. 
his blood was tested. He came back with nothing in his system. From working in hospitals for, for over a decade, I learned that they only test for what they're looking for. And if they weren't looking for amphetamines, and at that time they weren't, they didn't look for them, therefore they weren't detected. You know, many of us believe, and I used to believe this, that you put the blood into a machine and it comes back, amazingly enough, with like 100 or 200 things that are in that blood. No, that's not the way it works. You have to test for th specific things. You have to do specific tests. It's not some kind of magic eight ball. <laughs> I used to believe that. So, you know, if you if you've thought that, I'm with you. I, I used to believe that, oh, you, you put the blood in and you get back what's in it. No, no, no. You have to test for each thing. So he was never tested for amphetamines, so we don't know. But I'm going to talk about how I, I disagree with Joe McGinnis on his point about the amphetamines causing this crime. And I'll tell you why. Uh, but he did, apparently, he was, he did confess to taking a lot of amphetamines, which call, can cause a, a change in your, you know, way of thinking. And I'm going to point that out, but the point about it is it doesn't change your way of thinking it to, to something completely different than what you actually think. So I'm going to get to that. All right. So now let's take a look at, and I wanted to point that out about the, uh, um, about this, 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 uh, this documentary. And so if you watch that documentary, it's got some interesting things in it, but I just can't support it. And, and it's, it's a lot of, um, crap, shall we say. All right. So now, um, let me get to some more points. All right. Let's go. I want to point out the actual crime now, because this is where it gets very interesting. And I want to point out what I think about what happened. All right. So now let's go to something simple. Let's start with, let's start with where this crime occurred. Okay. So if you don't know this crime really well, and even if you do, I'm going to show you what I think just stands out to me. And I'm not even going to talk necessarily yet about all the blood issues, which, which is what did a man, but okay. Let's just talk about how it went down. Okay. So Jeffrey supposedly is sleeping on the sofa. I don't know. Is that the sofa he's sleeping on? Why is all that crap? Okay. Anyway, sleeping on the sofa. And um, he's woken up to three to four people. He claims four people were in the room. Uh, two white dudes, a black dude, and a, and, a, and a white female in the floppy hat with the candle. Okay. They are attacking him. Attacking him. He's wearing his pajamas. Suddenly they're attacking him. While they're attacking him, okay, this is why, is this something I'm bothered by? Okay, let me find it. All right. He hears while they are attacking him, he hears his wife scream, Jeff, Jeff, help. Jeff, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? All right. Let's take a look at that statement. Why are they doing this to me? There's a lot wrong with that statement. One is if there's four people in the room attacking you and she says they are attacking her, they indicates at least two more people. So now you've got six crazy hippies <laughs> coming into the house and attacking everybody. Six crazy hippies. Now let's talk about the Manson murders just for a sec. Um, the Manson murders had somebody who was their cult leader, a very charismatic fellow, you know, Charles Manson. Um, he gathered together his group. He, he got them to a point where he could, could encourage them to do things. According to Helena Stokely, there was, a, there was some dudes out here just who decided one night they're just going to go in and murder, murder some people for no reason whatsoever. Oh, oh, wait a minute. They were one, maybe one of them was mad at Jeffrey McDonald because he like, wouldn't give him some drugs. Maybe they wanted drugs, but they never took any from his house. They just decided to go in and brutally, brutally murder a woman and two children, not kill Jeffrey McDonald. Okay. So who are these people? They don't have a leader. There's no big cult leader encouraging them to do something really cool. There's just some people like sitting around one night, like, on drugs, probably stoned out of their minds and hardly able to move, who suddenly get the energy to jump up and all run, get together, six of them at least, 
and go into this house and kill people. Now, mind you, one of the concerns the investigators had was that if there's six people, first of all, there had to be four people with him in this, this living room and two people at least in the back room for this to be going on, for, for his wife to shout out, why are they doing this to me? I'll get to the they doing this to me in a minute, but let's look at the damage in the house. All right, so here we have, the, they noted that this table has been knocked over. That is the extent of the damage, of the, the, the uh, shall we say, this fight in the living room. Now he's fighting supposedly against at least three of them. I don't know what Helena's doing, but okay. Sometimes he says she's doing something, but he supposedly ends up with his pajamas locked around his hands, which makes no sense to me. And he's fighting them off and they're stabbing at him and they're bludgeoning him. Four people in this little teeny room and the only thing you have knocked over is that table. Now, you wanna see the rest of the room? Well, let's look at the rest of the room because now oh, maybe there's massive damage in the rest of the room. Here's the rest of the room. Oh yeah, okay, the television's still there. People, things are sitting on the table, you know. Does anything look disturbed to you? Nothing looks disturbed to me. Right next door, they make a big deal of this. There's a table with his children's little Valentine cards on it. For all the bouncing around, banging, throwing things, killing, attacking him, none of these cards fall over. Okay, maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't. Maybe that's just, you know, one of those things that happened. But only thing you see really disturbed is the, 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 the table pushed over. Now, uh, the, the investigators came in and they pushed that table. They kicked it. And it never ended up on the side. It always rolled over on its back. And that was made a big deal of. And personally, I'm not that big on that one because somebody could have been standing right here and the table hit them and just stopped. So I don't think that's huge. But the fact that it's literally the only real disturbance in that room, when you have five people fighting, or at least if Helena's just standing around with a candle, at least four people fighting. He's fighting for his life. Nothing much is disturbed. Makes no sense. So that is problematic. But now I want to go to, um, by the way, I'm not going to show crime scene photos. Uh, I will not do that. Um, they're very, I've seen them. They're very gruesome. They're horrific. And I'm not going to show them. I'm going to just tell you what you need to know. Okay. So now here's a problem I have with his statement. The biggest problem. Colette, his wife, shouts out, Jeff, Jeff, help. That, that I'm okay with. Jeff, Jeff, why are they doing this to me? What? Why would Jeff know, first of all, why they were doing anything to her? Why would she assume that they had any reason to do anything to her? You know, you wake up into a, basically a home invasion. Your question isn't, why are they doing this to me? It's like, help, just help. There, there's, there's killers in the room. They're trying to kill me. They're trying to kill me. You don't look for a motive, but... As I point out, you always look back at something that happened and you can twist it slightly, you can use it. What is the most likely thing that would have been said by Colette if she were being attacked by Jeffrey? What she would have said is, Jeffrey, why are you doing this to me? That would be a question. I would be asking if my husband were trying, were, were bludgeoning me and trying coming after me with, a, with an ice pick. I'd go, why are you doing this to me? I couldn't understand it. The motive is bizarre to me. I'm your wife. You have children. Why would you do this? Jeff, Jeff, why are you doing this to me? That makes sense. That she would say that about killers makes zero sense. All right. One other thing. At the same time, he he hears his older daughter, Kim Kimberly, screaming, Daddy, 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 Daddy. Okay. Let's say... Now, daddy's not in the room. Ah, you're, you're a five-year-old and you see your mommy being bludgeoned. Okay. You might call for daddy. It's possible. You might also scream mommy, 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 mommy because you see your mommy being killed. Um, or maybe somebody's attacking you so you're calling daddy, daddy, daddy to get help. But she never said help. She just said daddy, daddy, daddy. Uh, it is presumed by the, uh, the, the blood spatter patterns and the blood drop patterns that while Colette was being killed by Jeffrey, his five-year-old daughter woke up and walked into the room and seeing her daddy attacking her mother said, Daddy, 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 Daddy. 
That makes sense. So, so far, what his wife said made no sense, but what she sh probably said does make sense, and what Kimberly probably said when she saw her mother being killed by her father also makes sense. So those are two very, very important things, which to me are very, very striking. Um, now, there's one other thing very striking about the crime scenes. Okay, first let me just tell you the basic, um, that, that, you know, it's interesting, you point that out, that was made in the movie. Oddly, which, well, you know, not oddly, but I never, I, I, this struck me right from the beginning, and when I saw the movie, I know, I actually been wondering, why is nobody pointing this out? Why is nobody pointing this out? And then I saw the movie and they pointed it out, and I'm like, there you go. Somebody did point it out, thank God. Because it's, a, it's absolutely a huge point. Absolutely a huge point. So thank you, Elizabeth. That is true. It's in the movie, and, which is one reason I like that movie. Because it made sense. All right. All right. So um, Red Rum says, the stereotypical table toss. 70s furniture wasn't the strongest. That was a crappy table. Yeah, you can just knock that sucker over. But the fact that Nothing else really was disturbed is, is disturbing, you know, so um, that's problematic. Now, let me let me just show you the um, let me show you the the blood spatter, the blood stuff. I'm not going to go into it because it's, I say it's, it's been covered so many places else else that I'm just not going to repeat it. OK, well, hold on a second. Let me find it. Uh, it's over here. OK. All right. Let me oh, let, let me point out some a couple, couple other things on the way there. The, the, the bludgeoning tool, which he, he originally said was a baseball bat. Um, oh, by the way, uh, he did say he was being attacked with a baseball bat. Uh, and and let, me, let me let me uh, run over here to, this is his face. Now, mind you, his wife was stabbed, bludgeoned and stabbed 22 times, and his kids were bludgeoned and stabbed, and it was very nasty. Want to see his face? Okay, he's being attacked with a baseball bat. Four, three, at least three people attacking him and stabbing him. That's his face. Oh, you yeah. know, suffered a lot of damage, didn't you, Jeffrey? I mean, really, you should have punched yourself a few times and slammed your head into a wall or something, because it's not much. It's so little, it's ridiculous. So I'm having a little problem with that. But OK, let's go back to the bludgeoning tool. Uh, this is a piece of wood um, with some white paint on it, which is presumed to have come from his own house because it matches the actual paint in his house. As a matter of fact, it matches some of the uh, paint on his bed, um, on, the, uh, on, the, on the frame of the bed. Um, now, um, I have a little disagreement with Ken Maines on this. By the way, Ken Maines has a very good show on this, so go ahead and watch it. Uh, he believes that this, this thing originally was supporting the bed. It's like it, the bed was like, eh, you know, so this piece of wood was put under to, to keep the bed up. And he believes that there was this fight and he started and Jeffrey started attacking Colette and 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 something was shoved and pushed and this wood came out from under the bed and now now Colette was on the floor and she picked it up and started trying to defend herself and then he grabbed it out of her hand and beat the crap out of her okay it's not a bad thought um there's also a belief that because a hairbrush was nearby that she picked up a hairbrush and tried to defend herself and that's why he got that mark somewhere up here. Okay, I'm having trouble with either one of those stories. Um, not that she wouldn't have defended herself, but both of those stories, which bothers me, is that it's like his response to her was because she attacked him first, or that he was doing something and she, because she attacked, attacked him, he then went into a rage. Okay? This is kind of the, in this case, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying Ken, but, Maines is blaming the victim or neither is anybody else who's saying that she fought back. I'm just simply saying that it's interesting that his supposed rage may not have come from, you know, originally it came from her fighting back. And I don't believe that's anything to do with this case. And it could have happened. So Ken, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe that's true. She did defend herself, but I don't believe she defended herself with that piece of wood. And I'm going to explain why a little later. Um, but, you know, we all have different you know, we're, none of us were there. So we all come trying to come up with what exactly happened? Why would this guy do this? But I'm going to give you my theory later. All right. This was also, this is one of the knives used. Um, and then there was this ice pick here. Um, he claimed none of them came from his house. 
Sure. Okay. They were all found outside his house, right in the backyard. So, so six hippies, at least six now, um, in my opinion, uh, used used uh, three weapons, and then they just when they left because you know they wanted to blame it on him, left all the weapons in the backyard. When it makes a lot more sense to take those weapons and toss them someplace where no one will ever find them, and maybe they have your fingerprints on them or your DNA or your, you know something. You know, because you've been beating the living crap out of the entire house, except for Jeffrey. And wouldn't you be a little suspicious? Okay, so, you know, they're all drugged out, so they don't know what they're doing. So they just drop them all in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Okay. You can believe what you want to believe. But okay, I'm not believing it, Jeffrey. Don't think it happened. I think all those things came from your house because they came from your house. Now, if they came from your house, you would have to think six guys. No, I'm sorry, five guys and a woman came into the house with zero weapons. They intended to brutally murder this entire family. So they came into the house with no weapons, went to your kitchen, shuffled around till they found, oh, look, man, there's an ice pick here and a knife. You're sleeping through this, of course. And then the other one went into the bedroom and like picked up the bed and pulled out the wood and started whacking on Colette. You know, this is how ridiculous the story is. This is why nobody, well, not nobody, but many didn't believe it, including for once, the juries that I don't approve of civilian juries, but thank God at least they got this one right because they thought it don't make sense. All right, so Jeffrey, um, here, now let me show you this part of it. All right, um, so what we have here is, it's hard, kind of hard to see all this. So you can, you can go to any site and find this. They're just showing where the bodies are, but what you're gonna notice, and I'm, as I said, I'm not gonna go through all of this. This is the blood type issue. It was a really weird case because everybody in the family had a different blood type. Colette had A, Jeffrey had B, Kimberly had AB, and Kristen had O. So you could track exactly where all the blood was and who brought it where. And so what happened is when they looked at this, there's a great scene in, um, in Fatal Vision a miniseries where this is explained in detail and it's brilliant and it shows how that somebody with a you know, moved, did different things and moved bodies from one place to the other and then attacked this person, but only after they attacked that person. And so there's so much information here about how this couldn't have been committed by anybody but Jeffrey McDonald. That is clear that he committed the crime, moved the bodies around, put children back in bed, moved Colette. I mean, it's just, it's overwhelming. And I say, I'm not going to get into that, but you can go check that out. Overwhelming. Now, Let's go back to what he says. And he says two things that just quickly don't make any sense. And, oh, I want to bring up Freddy Kassab. Freddy Kassab is a stepfather of Colette. Um, what the best stepfather you would ever want. Her father had committed suicide, and then Freddy married her mom, and she adored Freddy, and he adored Colette, and he was like the dad to her. He became her dad 100%. And he fought like a son of a gun. He, in the beginning, along with his wife, believed that this guy was innocent because he couldn't imagine that he would have killed his family. So he fought for him, fought for the army, do your job, find the killers. No, he didn't pay any attention. He didn't really, you know, he's like OJ. He's like, <laughs> oh yeah, I got things to do. I don't need to find the killers. I know who the killer is. Anyway, um, so Freddy Kassab fought and fought and fought to get the, get to, to support him they thought that the army was, he thought the army was being unreasonable and, and, and making him, you know, a suspect. And he thought the killers are still out there. The killers that killed my daughter and my grandchildren. He was beside himself. Eventually, Freddie started realizing there's something wrong with this guy. He started reading the actual details, the blood patterns throughout the house, his story that didn't match anything. And he finally realized, holy crap, my son-in-law killed Colette and the children. And then he went on a vengeance. And if it wasn't for Freddie, I don't think he would have ever been brought to justice. He worked his butt ski off trying to absolutely bring this guy to justice. And he succeeded. And, uh, you know, wow. I mean, what, what a great dad Colette had in Freddie. Um, but this is one thing that Freddie found that struck him when he was looking at all the crime scene photos and everything else. He claimed that, first of all, that... <laughs> Here's, a, here's something really weird. He claimed that when he found Colette, she had a knife in her chest and he pulled it out. And I think everybody's jumped on that and said, what? Aren't, 
he's a doctor. He should know you never remove a knife like that because that might be the thing that's holding the blood in there. And, you know, keep, you know it's, it's already in there and it's blocking things that have, it has severed. If you pull that knife out, he should know that. But yet he claims he pulled that knife out. Now, apparently, theoretically, that actually never even happened. Um, but then he supposedly gave her, you know, mouth to mouth resuscitation. Then, and he said he hurt air, whatever. So anyway, he goes and he says he gave mouth to mouth resuscitation to the children. But both children were found on their sides. How do you give mouth to mouth resuscitation? How do you do CPR if the children are on their sides? Are you telling me he went in there, turned them over on their backs, did that, did what he needed to do? which it would be, first of all, I think you have to put them on the floor and get them off the bed so they have a hard surface. You know, if you actually believe they're alive in any way, shape, or form, and then you do it. But these kids were like under the covers on their sides. So bull crap, dude. I mean, that's a terrible story. And it's interesting that when he was taken out, he was found alive. Um, interestingly enough. So let's go back to just why he's alive. All right, because here, here we have, um, yeah, he's alive. So, so six hippies come in, and and absolutely obliterate the wife and children. But the main witness, supposedly the guy they don't like, because they're killing the pigs, and the killing the pigs wouldn't be. Oh, you want? Uh, and it was written in the, in the um, on the. Uh, where's my where's my picture? There, my picture's gone on that. Where'd it go? Okay, let me find it over here. It was um. The kill the pigs was written on the headboard of, of the bed. Well, that's one of those that went missing on me. Um, it was written on the headboard of the bed, and pig was written. Oh, here it is. I, I knew I'd put that one in here. Pig. Okay. No. In her blood, written with a, 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 you know, one of those medical gloves, you know. So, isn't that interesting? Um, who would have those? Oh, yeah, they're, they're in quantity in his house. And lots of pieces of the gloves were ripped up and had blood on it. And, you know, it, it, I say, you have to check out all of that. But he, this was written. Okay, so, all right. So, obviously, it's not going to be Colette. She's just some sweet, sweet, sweet women. Children are little sweet things. The only pig thing you could even think about would be the army dude. So, what do they do? They go in and brutalize his family, but they leave him without hardly any injuries except for this very careful scalpel stab in his, to his side and leave him alive. Leave him alive. He's a witness. He's seen all four of the six. <laughs> four of the six. He's seen them. But they leave him alive. Why not just stab the living hell out of him, bludgeon him until his brains fall out? They're into the mood. Why aren't they doing that? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> There's no good explanation. So after this all happens and he, he wakes up and amazingly is alive, he crawls around and does all these things. Then he goes and calls calls for help, right? Now, a lot of people believe that he stabbed himself and then called for help. I don't believe that. I believe he called for help and then stabbed himself. You know, he had a collapsed lung, which is, you know, it's got time to survive. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not critical, critical. Um, I think he's smart enough to know as a doctor what you do is you make your phone call first, then you make sure that they're on their way, <laughs> you know, and then you stab yourself just in case you screw up. You want to make sure that you're taken to the hospital on time. So I believe that's when he did that. Um, I don't believe it was really earlier than that. Um, so then he's taken to the hospital and amazingly enough, you know, he's pretty much fine. And, you know, they need to put a, eventually put a tube in. But other than that, he probably, you know, a couple Band-Aids and he was, he was good to go. You know, so he did not suffer very much damage for Four people attacking him, killing all the family. After they'd done that, why didn't they just come back and make sure he was dead? You know, they didn't do that. They didn't. They didn't come back into the living room and say, "Hey, that dude's that dude's not dead." You know, and and finish him off. That makes absolutely zero sense. So the problem the prosecution had, and Freddy Kassab eventually had, is that the story is garbage that nothing could have gone down this way. Not one shred of evidence was found that any intruders were in the house. The location made no sense of intruders coming into the house, that six people were in the house and they couldn't, then had no proof of that, like footprints and blood that, you know, would have occurred at the time. Um, no other DNA, nothing. There was zero about anybody else. 
Now, the defense will say, well, there was zero, they had other people came into the house, like, you know, the emergency people and the police, and, you know, they didn't leave anything either. Okay, fine. But we're talking about six crazed people who are, like, like racing through the house going, woohoo, and they didn't leave a shred of evidence. That's nonsense. And then his, his, his injuries being so minor, his story, none of his story makes any sense. How his family was killed makes no sense. That he did CPR makes no sense. That he pulled the knife out of her chest makes no sense. It's garbage. It's a garbage story. And it's the best he could come up with because what he, now, because he saw, he knew of the Manson murders and he decided to make this look like the Manson murders. Now, the question would be, after all of this, and I th I'm sure I left a bunch of crap out because there's, this is, a, there's a massive amount of information and certainly, you know, later people are going to ask me questions. And you can ask them below. Uh, feel free to comment. Um, I will see if I can comment back on them. Oh, you missed this evidence that proved you was guilty. You missed this evidence that seems to make him innocent. Um, I can't tell all of this story without taking up. You know how long that book was? <laughs> Fatal Vision is one of the longest true crime stories I've ever read. Um, and Fatal Vision was a miniseries. You can't get this all in in a short period of time. So what I'm most interested in is the psychology of why, because I believe he's guilty 100%, why he would do this horrific thing. You know, what a seemingly loving father, a seemingly loving husband would suddenly kill his entire family. That is what I'm most interested in. So let me go to that. Let me stop just for a second to see. I haven't been able to see your comments. I'm sure there's a thousand of them. <laughs> um, Goodness gracious. Um, oh, that's an, uh, yeah. <laughs> Where is the wax from this candle? Yeah, they never found that. But you know, they, I mean, who carries a candle around for that long? And I mean, this is the silliest thing ever. Um, staged, yeah, it does appear to be staged. Um, absolutely, 100%. Um, oh, that's an interesting point. Collapsed long and he tried to give CPR. Hmm, interesting. Well, you know, as I said, I don't think that lung collapsed until after he made the phone call. Personally, that's what I think. Okay, so let's look at this guy now. All right, let me let me go back to some of my stuff on him because this is what I think is just fascinating about him. Okay, let me see if I can find the spot I was on. Uh, oh, I actually found. Oh, don't do that. Okay, here we go. Now. Was he a happily married man? Okay. Now, let me go back to the voice of Jeffrey McDonald. This is what he said in his book. Things again, I'm just like, say what? Colette looked mortified. Okay, she's mortified because her ex-boyfriend showed up, blah, blah, blah. I believe her relationship with Dean Chamberlain had been severed by that time. They had been together, then they broke up, and this guy named Dean hung out with her. Um, and then they broke, then he came back into Colette's life. I could never understand Colette's fascination with him because he was a non-supportive sort of drain on her. I didn't like him, never liked him. Okay, well, you got your little jealousy, aren't you, dude? Okay, so then I wrote to call Colette out of the clear blue. Never believed anything's the clear blue. All right, I repeated that, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could get together again? All right, so then this goes on. Let me, let me go to where they hook up. All right. You remember those stories about 1972 and 1973 and the joy of joy? <laughs> okay. To this day, I think she probably had not made love with anyone. But she may have. She may have slept with Dean Chamberlain. Okay. Don't do that. I can't believe she slept with Dean Chamberlain. Okay. I suspect she probably did sleep with a sophomore from Purdue that summer on the beach, but that's not for sure. I suspect more likely that she did sleep with Dean Chamberlain in their later romance in high school. But again, that's not for sure. First of all, what kind of guy talks about his dead wife's early sexual escapades? I mean, that's pretty trashy. You know what I'm saying? She's dead. And, and that says, no, this does not make any difference to what happened to her or what happened to you. So you, basically you're trying to disparage her in a really weird way. Then he says, I had made love with a few girls that I've been dating with high school, but far and away, the only girl that I really made love to at any length was Penny Wells. Now, Penny, well Penny Wells shows up in 
comes and goes in this whole saga. Apparently, she was a hot chick, you know, when you like the ball. Okay. Um, we had a good time together, especially physically. In our senior year, we were sleeping together, and um, we had an incredibly physical thing. Kind of like Joy. Very torrid, as a matter of fact, regards our physical attraction for each other. It was instantaneous and long-lasting and repetitive. Anywhere, in the car, the drive-in movie, at parties, at her house, at my house, on dates, the whole bit. Maybe on the back of a pony. Couldn't resist. And it was just sort of endless. We just couldn't stop. Okay, so you're writing a book. You're, 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 Joe McGinnis is writing the book, but you're telling Joe McGinnis this is what you want in the book. Now, Colette's parents are suffering from the tragic, tragic murder of their daughter and grandchildren, and you're going to start talking about sex with other women. You know, or, or sex with your wife. I mean, it's just, isn't that tacky as hell? What does it show? It shows that you don't have a lot of perception about how other people view things. Okay. Let's see. I always liked Penny. Oh, no. Penny was and is a very beautiful girl. She was sort of a plastic princess. I don't mean to say that derogatorily. Yes, you do. Uh, she is an extraordinarily good-looking woman. I don't know if she's still good-looking now. Oh, thanks. She's aged a bit. You ain't so good-looking either now. Um, but she certainly was then. She was a little bit of an airhead. Yeah, more insults, maybe. But she was very dependent on me, and I like that. Now, dependency is a big issue for this dude. He liked that Colette was dependent on him. He liked that every girl is depend dependent on him. Why does he like dependency? Because that means they do whatever he says. They don't, they, he can control them. He's a very controlling man. So anybody who thinks that he's just the nicest husband and boyfriend and father, no, he's a control freak total control freak and that's a sign of narcissism and psychopathy all right um i always liked penny i'm not sure i was ever in love with her as i see love now i don't know that you ever have seen love but i suppose i was in high school love with her whatever that means i thought of her a lot there was a tremendous amount of tumultuous physical energy between us and we had an amazing amount of sexual experience together which was not my first time i want you to know i'm the stud man i'm the stud I ball lots of women. All right. But it was certainly my first real affair with anyone. The first time, he calls it an affair, not a relationship. Because he, it, later on, he considers all his relation, the sex he has with women is meaningless. He does say that. There, it was all meaningless. Even during my marriage, it was just meaningless. I just had sex with women and it was all meaningless. So it shouldn't have interfered with my marriage one bit. And my wife, quite frankly, he's not saying this, but I am. Shouldn't be bothered by it because it was all meaningless. You wonder how much Colette found out about his meaningless little affairs. So, or sexual escapades, shall we call it. Um, you know, women just can't resist them. Okay, so, let's see. But it's certainly my first real affair with anyone. The first time that there was any sustained amount of sexual energy passing between myself and any woman. And without question, this was the first time for Penny. You know, he, he's so hot. Man, Penny might have slept with other dudes, but pff, it just didn't compare to him because he was the guy that really turned her on. All right. Um, oh, then he goes on. He says that the fact that she was studying to be a dental technician, it just seemed like a different world. The differences in our approach to life, I think intellectually, was sharpened all of a sudden. It crystallized. We really didn't have that much to say. But her letters were this incredible disappointment in which really nothing much was said. We talked about the weather. So he goes on about this. Then he goes to Colette. Because, you know, he's, I guess he's, it's hot with Penny, but supposedly he dumps her because she's a bore outside of bed. So now he's going to Colette. Our first episode was very, very tentative. There was no forceful taking. She was very frightened. I was caring for her and babying her and gently taking her through it. Oh, you know, because... He's that kind of guy. She was totally unfamiliar with, for instance, the actual act itself and was pos and its positioning. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, mm. I remember it seemed like an eternity of patience on my part. Oh my God, what a great guy you are. I mean, you were so gentle, so gentle, you know. I'm not patting myself on the back at all. Yeah, you are. Uh, it just seemed like it took hours and hours to gradually get her to relax. 
Her legs were shaking and she was extremely frightened. And I remember consoling her and holding her very tightly for a long time and asking her why she was crying. And she emphatically said she didn't have any pain. It wasn't that at all. It was sort of, she said, a cry of happiness that she seemed so fulfilled. Sorry, couldn't resist. Oh my God. Really? Really? Just, just really? Uh, okay. <sighs> that was so disgusting. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, if I, if I get killed, I really don't want anybody who ever had sex with me to be going on about exactly how we did it. You know, I really, I really don't appreciate that terribly much. Um, so, um, do you think, you think it stops there? Oh no. Okay. So then it goes on to say, let me, let me find it in the book. Um, I just lost the page there. So, all right. So let me go to the next part of, of the relationship with Colette. All right. Um, because we'd recently been making love, it was incredibly very exciting sessions. We talked about this for years afterwards. In fact, as one of our most memorable lovemaking sessions. Oh, where did they have, oh, where did they have sex? Oh, it was, where was that at? Uh, she avoided the subject of Penny Wells, you think? Okay, we never talked about her being a virgin. We did make love in some wild places, though. I remember thinking what an adventure it was. And Colette felt the same way. Uh, sure she did. Well, that we were here making love only 400 feet from this whole crowd of people watching this big softball game. Oh, yeah, that was the event. But she, she was excited that, guys, people were close by when they were having sex. Okay. Oh, my God. Goes on to the next chapter five. But our lovemaking had increased greatly throughout the trips to Skidmore and her trips to Princeton and our vacations together and now the summertime and our love was in full bloom. There was no question about it. Um, I promise I'd pull out as usual and we were extremely passionate, you know, passionate, you know, passionately making love and it, we sort of exploded and we lay there in each other's arms and we did something which for us was not common. Um, normally we made love and occasionally like, especially on our honeymoon, I remember that we made love many times in one day, but we did not have this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, like this need between us, make love two or three times a day. We usually made love once or something like that. But I remember this was specific day. We laid there and 20 minutes later we were making love again and we stayed there till about 1 30 to 3 2 in the morning in the hammock in each other's arms and I remember neither of us felt any guilt or any negative feelings. Hey. Okay I'll stop there with the Colette thing. <sighs> but you certainly, certainly don't seem to be impressed by this guy you think? Okay so now that was that was from the book and then I saved a bunch of other other comments from the book. All right, now let me see if I can find where I'm at here. Ah, so that's how he that's how he presented um, how he presented Colette, and now you you know that he presented Joy. Um, oh, I, I do I do want to mention the uh, Dick Cavett show. He did the tech, Dick Cavett show after she uh, the family murders and. He got on the show and he made jokes about, oh, you know, we were sitting on the sofa and we watched a talk show. <laughs> and everybody kind of went, <laughs> you know, and it was really creepy. And that was one of the things that sent Freddie Kassab off um, that, 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 that talk show, uh, you know, that he seemed to be in, really into getting the attention of the talk shows. And he was really concerned about who's going to write his, the book about him. And he loved the publicity, just loved the publicity. So we got a guy whose family has been murdered, but he's more interested in the publicity for himself and being famous and making money than he is about catching the killers. Hmm. You know who that sounds like. Okay, so anyway, he was on Dick Cabot. So I want to go on to say, to talk about, um, okay, we talked about, oh, <laughs> let's see what happened to him in California because it just gets worse. And I, I just want to present this because in case you don't want to read the book, I just really want you to hit this home. But you have to, this is his words again, but you've got to understand that this was a life that Colette and I had planned, going to Yale and having the farm. And, um, and I, Colette and I were supposed to go to Yale and get a farm. I was supposed to be a hot shot, hot shot orthopedic surgeon and live on the farm with the kids. I can't, I mean, I can't keep that dream going without Colette and the kids. So I go out to California. So what? There's no crime in that. Essentially, to paraphrase all these pages that I'm turning, you know, I just had to change my life. 
So he goes out there. Right now in California, I'm director of the emergency department. After I left here in August, they made me director. Big deal. They called me in and said, despite what's happening, we still like you. I, and I said, big fucking deal. You don't have to like me. And they said, no, you're doing a good job. We want to make you director. So I'm director now. And he goes on about being a director. And then he says, I work very hard. I work on purpose. I've got to work. I stay busy and see a lot of people. I'm exhausted. I work a 12-hour shift. I make a lot of money. That's not my goal in life. I make a lot of money, so I spend a lot. <laughs> he sure does. That's not a crime. And we'll get into, in a little bit, I'm going to talk about the psychologist's viewpoint on why he works so much. Why he's always got to be the star of everything. Because that's an important narcissistic uh, issue. Um, to have to be in the limelight constantly. To have to have everybody think that you're the best. So anyway, he goes on and he says, what can I say about that? These arguments about other women are just, they're absurd. I've slept with a lot of women. It doesn't mean anything to me at all. It's never meant anything to me. It's been very easy for me my whole life. I haven't chased one girl in California and I must have slept, slept with 30 since I've been here. So, so these women mean nothing to him. They mean nothing. They're pawns in his little game. And he's even saying, oh, I don't even have to go get them. These women fall at my feet and want me to want me to have sex with them. And that includes Colette, and that includes Penny, and that includes Joy, and every woman that's been in his life. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, so let's go. So what happened with Joy? Here's another interesting thing with Joy. Joy, of course, was this extravagantly sensual person with a tremendous body. And I was dancing with everyone at the party, and Joy just decided, well, she was just, she was gonna too. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And she ended up dancing with Jack Snow and Isaiah Robertson, I think Jack Youngblood and a bunch of others. And I remember that I was furious that she had the nerve to do that. And then I calmed down and realized it was my decision. I made that decision. I would have to get control of myself and understand that if I was going to date other people and keep Joy at a distance, then probably she's going to end up dating. Well, okay, you're almost rational for a second there. So she came to me and said she couldn't live this way, blah, blah, blah. And we're in the middle, middle of this breakup, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So why was he with Joy? She was not Colette, and she never tried to be Colette. But she was defiant and rebellious. She was saucy and tantalizing on purpose, things that Colette never was. This is the problem, folks. Colette was not what he found exciting. He married her because she was pregnant. He was young at the time, got this family, and he was out having sex with lots of women, and he liked an exciting lifestyle, and he liked what he considered exciting women. Um, Joy, sometimes, it seemed like her goal in life was to turn on 100 men at a big cocktail party, and she did it without even trying. If she tried, it made it even worse. She was a staggeringly sensual person. Yeah, so he goes on about the tumultuous li uh, love affair. Okay, so now they break up. But even though, oh shucks, she's gone, here comes Bobby, B-O-B-B-I, who worked as a nurse. Got this one. Bobby, McDonald said, was and is this very, very gorgeous redhead. Stunning appearance, tall and very sophisticated looking. A really lovely creature, taller than Joy, though not as busty, not as nearly sensual, especially in her impact in her room. Because, you know, when you walk into a room and you want to have the hottest woman on your arm. But lovely in a more ethereal way. And I think it's attractive to a lot of different people. So he has to have women that are attractive to other people to know that he's getting more than they're getting. In other words, he, if he gets her, <laughs> you didn't get her. I did. She's sleeping with me. Because I'm going to tell everybody she's sleeping with me. And I'm going to put it in a book. I'm going to talk about her sex life. Okay. Um, I think uh, it's attractive to a lot of different people, although like the sap starts flowing in a group of men. When Joy walks by, whereas with Bobby, you know there are rays about her beauty, but it isn't quite the central beauty that Joy always had. In any case, I thought Bobby was one of the pretty girls I'd ever seen. The relationship blossomed very quickly, even under the stress at the time. It was funny. I always said to myself, and did say to myself, all through the first year or so with Joy, I, I mean with Bobby, can't get them, you know. You can't tell the women apart because, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter to him. I was not going to just sort of fall into a situation and have it happen. I was uh, going to. Oops, I, I, I don't know what happened. I missed that page. Anyway, oh here it is. I was going to be. Where is it? Okay. 
in, more in control of it. And I told Bobby right from the go, I wasn't looking to be married. I just had ended a long-term relationship with Joy and it ended kind of painfully. <laughs> more so than your wife and children being murdered? Okay. And I was in the midst of this thing and, and I still had an indictment over me, you know, because that sucks too. She completely understood and we started dating. But it's just like always. You date a person two or three times in a row and pretty soon all of your friends can do is ask you to out as a couple. And whenever you want to have people over for dinner or go somewhere with a foursome or something, it's much easier to call a girl that you know instead of starting to play the singles game. And so Bobby and I, as well as being attracted to each other, sort of got into our one-on-one -on -one situation fairly quickly. Okay, so it blossomed to the point where they went to vacation in Hawaii. Isn't that sweet? Okay, we're in Hawaii at this condominium and incidentally an incredibly romantic time for sheer fun and opulence, you know, doing nothing but lying in the sun and making love. It was, I think, even equal to the trip I took with Joy to Tahiti. So anyway, they get this thing that he'd won this, this uh, I guess this, um, this uh, the Fourth Circuit ruled in his appeal. So it goes on, he goes on to say that um, he wondered whether, I don't think my initial fatuation with Bobby had anything to do with Colette. She was an alarmingly good looking woman, really chic and sophisticated looking. But then she said, as I, I think as we started seeing each other frequently, you know, falling in love and spending a couple years together, uh, she got closer to Colette. Uh, by that I mean that Bobby, I think in my mind, created some confusion over who I was in love with. Was I loving Bobby or was I love with Colette? But here's the, here's the thing. I'm going to try and move forward here. I just want to point this out. This is the thing. Okay. Ready? This is the clincher. Besides, Bobby was beginning to. This was, of course, two years into our relationship now. I guess two years this is, you know, that's enough for him. Uh, Bobby was beginning to need more, just as the old cycle always occurs. The old cycle always occurs, as it occurred with Colette, as it occurred with Joy. Now it's occurring with Bobby. Joy had needed more at two and a half or three years now. Now Bobby needed more. Seven days a week was what she wanted. We had a nice relationship on a five day a week basis. Well, four day a week basis. <laughs> He really didn't like to have to do much of the week, but it wasn't enough. There was this unease in Bobby all the time and constant picking and a need to reinforce and be told that she was loved. Well, she's in a relationship with you. She wants to know that she's loved. Even stronger than Joy, to be honest, she's a more insecure person. As he said, Colette was very insecure. She has a lot of great strengths, but on this particular point, she was very insecure. She was, she was making visible demands. You know, how dare you? You're my boyfriend. I'm making demands, both verbally and with body language. And we got into this absolutely identical situation that Joy and I had gotten into, where we both loved each other. It wasn't this, again, tumultuous A-plus sensual love that Joy and I had, uh, with quicks up and downs and lots of sensual makings up and down, trips everywhere and sort of... Uh oh, somebody, did I just dis disappear? Oh, that was weird. Okay, I'm, am I back, everybody? Because um, it flashed, the, the screen went dark for a second there. Well, I'm continuing as long as you tell me I'm back. Am I back? I'm going to finish this up and I want to tell you about the psychologist and then I'll end the end the, the uh, this part of it and I'll check on your questions and comments. Okay, um, I hope I'm here. Am I here? Can somebody just tell me if you can see me again? Because the screen flashed off for a second. But it says I'm still broadcasting. Oh, good. Okay. Blurry. Oh, I've gone to blurry. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to finish this up because I don't think I can do now. Anyway, um, listen to what I'm saying and don't look at my face. Okay. So she, he says, it was a different kind of thing, more structured and more orderly, partially because Bobby liked it that way, but certainly because my life was much more business-like and professional than it was before and more dedicated to work plus paying Bernie and getting ready for the case. So in other words, he's starting to work a lot to get away from her. Does that sound familiar with Colette? But in any case, I found that I could devote less emotional effort to Bobby at this time than even to Joy. And our relationship took the same six month downward spiral that Joy and I had undergone. Almost for the same reason, I couldn't give up enough time and verbal effort and emotional commitment to truly, you know, to truly be dedicated to one person. 
I just couldn't do it. It wasn't in me. I didn't have the strength. I had too many other things that were happening that were, I felt were more important, like other women <laughs> and freedom and not having to deal with a real relationship. And so eventually we split. Okay. That to me is why he killed Colette and the children. Look at the situation. He married Colette when she was pregnant, and it was more of an exciting time. He was getting married. You know, I've, you know that makes you important. Then you have kids. That makes you important. But then you get to this point where they become a, a drain. You, they become somebody who's, you know, they demand a lot of attention. And interestingly enough, he was saying that at the time they were at Fort Bragg, that this was finally, Colette was saying, finally a time when we can have more time as a family, and she was going to have a new baby. He was doing everything he could to get out of there. He, was, he wanted to go on a trip to uh, Russia, this boxing trip that didn't even exist, while she was going to have the baby. He wanted out. And as a matter of fact, even though he's a doctor, he refused to be in the, in, in the, in the room when she had the babies. Isn't that interesting? He said, I don't see why I should have to. Hmm, okay. Um, so he got to the point, I believe, where this was becoming going to be more and more of a family life. So now he's going to have to spend more time with the family and there was a darn baby on the way. So even if he thought he could get away with, you know, not, you know, the kids growing up, now he's got a new one. He's got to deal with that too. I think he wanted out. He had been already having sex with lots of women. He was now making money. He had now gotten to the point where he could have fun and it wasn't going to be with that family. He wanted them gone. So the issue comes down to, and this is where I believe this was premeditated. I don't believe he went into a rage that night. Maybe he was doing amphetamines, which helped him be able to do what he did. But I don't believe for a minute he came back and everything was fine. And he went into the bedroom and uh, the child had peed in his bed, the bedwetting issue. And he moved the kid and then he had to go sleep on the sofa. So he was mad about bedwetting. And then he went back in and for some reason he had like his quick argument started with, with Colette and she hit him with a hairbrush and he lost his mind and killed her. No, I don't believe that for a minute. I believe absolutely that he planned to kill Colette that night. He was done with his marriage and he wanted out and he was Catholic, couldn't divorce us theoretically. And so he was like, what am I going to do? And as many psychopaths do, Scott Peterson and, 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 you know, Chris, Chris Coleman and, and, uh, the other Chris, you know, um, they want their families gone so they can go on with life. They just want them out of the picture. They, they don't want child support. They don't have to deal with them. They don't have to see them. They don't want any of that crap. So I think he went to kill Colette. Now, the interesting thing about this is I don't know absolutely whether he intended to kill the children because once he got rid of Colette, he could pretend that these crazy hippies came in, attacked his wife, attacked him. But, you know, since they're children they didn't attack the children because the children wouldn't be witnesses and they just wanted to kill the pigs which would be the adults he may have been planning that and uh and thinking well you know once i get rid of her i don't have the baby deal anymore i don't have her i can pawn the kids off on her parents who would take them and then i could be you know the cool dad who shows up once in a while and i could have my freedom or he decided to kill the entire family because he was just done uh the one reason i think he might not have intended to kill the kids that night is because when um, his older daughter Kimberly said daddy 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 looked like he had smashed her head in when he was wielding that that thing so she may have actually come in and he hit her or she came in and saw him killing her mother and then he had no choice but to wipe her out you know just get rid of just get rid of the kids I'm done so psychopaths can change on the dime as to far as to what is you know, might as well do um, and that you can kill with without having much feeling. If you're a psychopath, it's very easy. Uh, you choose to do it and they're just pawns. So you just eliminate the pawns. Just stab and stab and stab. It seems like a difficult thing to do to a child, but if you don't care about that child because you're a psychopath, you can do that. So I believe it was premeditated. He might've taken the drugs. He might've taken amphetamines and it hyped him up and helped him feel confident he could commit this crime. But I don't believe that amphetamines threw him into some kind of you know, rage. I don't believe that for a minute. Um, I don't think so. I really don't. I think it's absolutely premeditated. Um, he wanted them out of the way and all this stuff about the other women and his dissatisfaction with women, the way they, you know, get boring and the way they start making demands. Show me that he wanted out of this marriage. That wasn't just because there was bedwetting and he went crazy. Look, you know, he's a doctor. 
And he has kids. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that bedwetting isn't going to throw him into a massive rage. Or the fact that he hadn't had enough sleep. You know, I've worked in medical work. Um, I've gone three days without sleep. I, you know, I've got, I've, it's gotten so bad that somebody I was driving home and I heard music and the radio wasn't on. And I'm like, that's not good. <laughs> I get home and sleep like for, you know, whatever, you know, 16 hours straight. I've worked in those situations and I never got psychotic. I never started going crazy and going into rages. I don't believe that garbage. Yes, you could be tired and cranky, but you're not going to, you're not going to get up and bludgeon your family to death, stab them with, with, with ice picks and cut them up. You're just not going to do that. I mean, that's insane. So you have to be psychopathic to go there. So did the amphetamines help? Maybe, but I believe he already knew the Manson story in his head. I don't think he came up with that. I think that was the plan that he was going to do this. And the, um, one of the things that at the end I want to point out here is in uh, and, and, and Joe's book, uh, he talks about Harvey Cleckley's Ma Mask of Sanity book, which I own and I recommend highly. Um, he says that basically what happens is they put a mask on and everybody believes the mask that he's this great guy. And he puts that mask on. He wants you to believe he's a great guy. And he couldn't do things that you don't think he could do because he's a great guy. So he always puts to get on that mask and you don't see the, the, what's underneath it. I think that's very important. That was from the Mask of Sanity. And then he, he quotes, um, um, I think this quote came from, uh, uh, let's see, um, I want to find this. Uh, Kernberg, Kernberg is another psychologist. He wrote that the main characteristics of narcissistic personalities is to be is grandiose, and he was grandiose about everything. Extreme self-centeredness, you better believe it's about Jeffrey, and a remarkable absence of interest and empathy for others, absolutely. Um, and very eager to obtain an admiration and approval. Yes, they want you to absolutely think they're fabulous. And I believe he's got what, what I would put borderline personality disorder. It's never enough, he's psychopathic too, but never enough, the glass is always half empty unless he can fill it, unless you can fill it. Unless you can believe I am the most amazing thing in the world. And he keeps doing everything to prove he's the most amazing thing in the world. He's got to be the top dog. Um, it is as if they feel they have the right to control and possess others and to exploit them without guilt feelings. Absolutely. And behind a surface which is very often is charming and engaging, one senses coldness and ruthlessness. And she did. There were some things about him she, she was confused about. And that's what psychopaths will do to you. The patients not only lack emotional depth, but fail to understand complex emotion in other people. He absolutely did never see anything from somebody else's point of view. I want to point out uh, one other thing here. There's a lot of information, but I want to point out the bit by um, uh, my favorite, favorite psychologist. Where's my favorite psychologist one? Oh, where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Okay, hold on a second. Got so much information here, um, it's hard to find. Okay, wait a minute, I've got to go back up. I, this is um, Stanton Salmonow. He mentioned Stanton Salmonow, who's one of my absolute favorite guys, um, who wrote the best book on in, Inside the Criminal Mind. And I swear to God, I saw Stanton Salmonow here, and now I can't find it. Okay, one, one more second, and then I'll give up. Okay, where's Stanton? Hmm. Okay, he's gone missing. Okay, Stanton Salmonow also writes about this, and he's really good. But the Mask of Sanity book is excellent. Um, shows you what kind of person that he was. Okay, that's it. All right. Um, I may be blurry, but I'm still here. And now I want to check out. Hold on a second. Let me get a drink after all that. <sighs> I want to take a shower after I read all that crap he said. <sighs> He's just a sex god. He's a sex god. Okay. Now let's see. Oh, let me look at this. Benny says, fun fact, on the point of impotence, Scott Peterson also subscribed to porn channels after Lacey was killed and got a lot of Viagra pills. Hmm. I don't know that he was impotent. I don't know what was said before that, but, you know, Viagra will give you that extra sex godness, you know, that you can keep going forever and torture women because that's not necessarily what women want, is that you go on for hours. You know, they're like starting to do their laundry list. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see what uh, Joe also says. One question I have is why he thought all this drivel he wrote would somehow hide his true self and why he felt others would buy into it. Some have, but to most it strongly suggests guilt. Ha, exactly, Joe. Why would he write this garbage? I mean, this is absolutely the opposite of what you should say. 
You should talk about the love for your wife. You should talk about how you cared for her. You should talk about your children and, 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 and the things you did together. But he talks about sex, 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 sex with his wife, sex with other women. This does not make you some, you know, this just, it's creepy. It's freaking creepy. I'm sure Colette's parents thought it was disgusting especially when you talked about Colette. I mean, she has the right to privacy. She'd been murdered. Is it really okay that you say what kind of sex you had with her? That should be private. You should want the privacy for your wife, but he doesn't because he, he's so into himself. And the other women, thanks a lot, Jeffrey, for dragging me into it. I was with you for two years and now you talk this trash about me? I mean, this is insulting and it's disgusting, but he doesn't see how other people will see it. And that's the point you just made. He's he, that's what a psychopath does. He cannot understand how other people view things. And he thinks he's being cool and awesome, but he's not. Um, so yeah, uh, and it, it turned a lot of people against him when they read the book. And let me tell you, when I read this book and I, you know, that was the thing that stuck out more than anything else, which is why I read you all this niceness. <laughs> because I, yes, the crime scene, physical crime scene evidence was really, really, really strong. Absolutely. And his description of the scene and how it went down also made no sense. The fact that a bunch of hippies, up to six of them, would pick his house, go in and kill the, him, the wife and children and not even hardly mess with him made no sense. But on top of all of this, all of this sex talk through the entire book just showed me what kind of guy he was and showed me he, how psychopathic he was and what his true interests were. Money, fame, fancy living. Oh, he talks a lot about restaurants. I mean, my God, I mean, I do like good food. I'm a foodie, but he spends a lot of time talking about how we went to this great restaurant, had this good food. This great restaurant had this good food. He loves to talk about the high life. He wanted the high life. And believe me, moving to Connecticut and, you know, living on a farm with a freaking pony is not the high life. He may have pretended he wanted that, but I don't believe for a minute he did. I believe as soon as he saw, saw the door opened to this fantastic future. That future did not include his wife, children, and that damn pony. So, um, uh, <laughs> let me see what else you have to say. Um, let me go back up here. Um, <laughs> Red Rum says, his life is like an X-rated Mills and Boone Cup novel. This guy is not seeing things the way they really were, really are. Sex outdoors, you get ant fights. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this just because just I think this is true. Dudes like sex outdoors and in bathtubs a lot more than women. Because for women, that doesn't induce a lot of comfort and enjoyment as much as it does for guys. Because it just works different for women. The women's bodies work different than men's. Just in case you didn't know this. So if you're a dude out here, don't bathtub. Generally speaking, not really great. Hot tubs, not really good. You know, swimming pools, yeah. Okay, you know, and outdoors, if it's a beautiful place where it's private, and okay, that'll work. Okay, it will. But the concept that it's so exciting for women to always be in some kind of situation where the guy's more excited than the woman about these things. So, you know, um, he's, he's definitely saying these things from a male point of view. And I get it, dudes. I mean, it can be exciting for you in these ways. You don't put it in a book, <laughs> you know? You keep that to yourself and to a few other dude friends, don't mention names and just say, I had some great time. I, I, we, had, we had sex in the airplane bathroom, you know, uh, whatever you want to do, but you don't put it in a book, about, especially about your dead wife. I mean, ah, this is, this is wrong, man. This is wrong. <laughs> um, let's see what Doreen says. It makes sense that a guy with sexual problems would want an exciting woman because he would hope it would help. You know, I don't know. I honestly don't know that he has sexual problems. I mean, we're, I, you know, I think we're going someplace we shouldn't. Um, this is the, when we start fantasizing about what could be wrong with him, I don't think that's necessary. He had sex with a lot of women. He could get women pregnant. He's not having a problem with sex. I don't believe that, you know, just because these women were what he considered hot um, were having, is because he was having sexual problems. I believe that the point was that women wanted him, that he had to, insist that women wanted him and that he could have any woman he wanted. And that when women were with him, it was the best sexual experience of their life. Even if they were like actually going like this during, during the sex going, Jesus Christ, finish up, dude, cause it's not really working for me. You know, he wants to believe what he wants to believe that he is the 
And he's a Don Juan, total Don Juan. It's the hottest thing ever. I don't know that he's imp impotent or has sexual problems. I just think he wants to be the best. Remember, he's got to be the best doctor, the best this, the best that. He's always got to be on top, especially with women. So, <laughs> oh, good. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, sounds like the McCann's Drew Peterson list goes on. I'm not sure it has anything to do with McCann's or Drew Peterson. Mm. I think it's it's really more a case of the, the, the family annihilator thing, which is not accidental. It's not that one person is in the way. It's that the entire family is in the way. Um, um, let's see what else you have to say here. <laughs> and Martin, he talks about sex like he's rescuing a stray puppy. <laughs> You know, he, it's true. It's like, oh, that poor little girl. She she didn't know what life would be like. She didn't know what sex would be like until she met me. And then I rescued her and took her into my arms. And they passionately loved her. And then she knew what life was all about. Yeah, mm -hmm, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Carrie says, I do not believe the couple had a happy marriage. Colette asked her mother if she could visit with the children shortly before the murders. Mildred asked her to wait. Yeah, I want, oh, I do want to mention that. Oh, so sad. So terribly sad. Right before they got murdered, she asked her mother if she could come home for a bit with the kids. And Mildred, unfortunately, it was winter, and she looked out, and the pool wasn't ready, and it was kind of crappy. And she thought, well, why don't she just wait till a little couple more months till spring? You know, it's February. Come when it's nicer. The kids will have a better time. And she regretted that forever because she always wondered whether the real reason that Colette wanted to come home was because there was something wrong with the marriage and she wanted to be in a safe place. And she's, she never forgave herself for delaying that. Um, she feels horribly guilty. And, you know, I get, I get where she's coming from because, she, you know, it was also said, by the way, that Colette kept things to herself. She did not speak up about her marriage. She did not speak up about problems. She was very much, you know, she one of those kept things, you know, hidden from people. Uh, she wasn't out ratting them out. Um, and so I'm going to say there's probably a lot more problems in that marriage and she was willing to admit to other people or even to herself. And she just, you know, and also when you're living with a psychopath, by the way, since they do a lot of um, gaslighting, you often think it's your fault. You know, it, you know, poor guy's work. He's working so many hours. I'm not a good enough wife if I don't do these certain things. Like he never, he, he made this comment, I think it was on Dick Cavett, how he did the dishes. He was a green beret who was willing to do the dishes this one time. Really, dude? Like, it was like, you make, made it sound like, you know, wow, you know, I, I, you know, look what I have done, the most amazing thing in the world. I washed the dishes instead of my stupid, stupid wife who should be doing it. That's his attitude. And so she probably, any time she didn't do something that he wanted her to do, she probably felt it was her fault. He would make it sure that she felt it was her fault. I'm sure he thought, she thought the pregnancies were her fault. You know, obviously she got pregnant by him. He wasn't using a condom, was he? So, but I'm sure he made it feel like her fault. Her fault was everything probably. So she probably was suffering from you know, feeling very insecure, because he said she was, and feeling like she wasn't living up to what she should live up to. She probably is very confused, and, and psychopaths can confuse the living heck out of you. Um, <laughs> Joe says, this bloke's obsessed with sex. Either he's a fant fantasist or a narcissist, or perhaps both. Yeah, I think he's both. Um, you know, again, why would you bring up, this is, this is a true crime book about the murder of your, your wife and children. Why would you bring sex into it at all? At all. You know, at all. I mean, I say this, that like flashed out at me and I couldn't believe it. Oh, you know, um, motive. He, either he could not sexually satisfy her, he's trying to sell us a story how great the sex was, or she was cheating on him. I absolutely don't think she was cheating on him. I don't think she would dare cheat on him. Um, I think they could have gotten to the point. You know, she was, first of all, she was like five months pregnant um, at the time, and he was already cheating on her constantly. So you know, now she's going to be a bigger pregnant woman you know, and want less sex, and he's really annoyed with that. Um, I would just say he wasn't getting what he wanted. I don't think he cared what she got, and I don't think she would have, having two children and, and one on the way, she would have left him for a poor sex life or cheated on him. It's not happening. No, no. It was all about him. All about him. Um, <laughs> Martin says, this guy kind of likes himself, you think? Oh, my God. There, there is, 
That's some massive narcissism. I mean, massive narcissism. Just incredible. Let's see. Um, uh, I want to point out this out. Yes, this is true. Molly said, wouldn't the attackers first take out the male in the house? You bet. And then the others. Yeah, I mean, first of all, they had supposedly six people, right? You send one into the, couple into the wife. You could send one in toward the children because they're asleep anyway. And you still got three left to take care of him, you know? But yeah, you would make sure that he was done in. If you not before, at least after, because he is the witness. He saw you and you'd left him alive with hardly any damage at all. This is nonsense. This is so ridiculous. I can't, I can't, I can't even come up with why anybody would think that, oh yeah, he was really attacked. No, he wasn't. He really was not attacked. Um, so, um, yeah, this is it. Was the four blood types within one family always fascinated me and how they track the movements? Yeah, you gotta check it out. The best thing is Fatal Vision, the, the miniseries, for ex for showing that. I mean, it's it's in Fatal Vision, the book, and it's in a lot of other places. But that movie, it shows uh, uh, the it was a detective, I think it was, uh, or somebody were investigator of some sort was talking to Freddie Kassab. And he was saying, do you want to hear this? And he said, yes, I have to hear this. And then he goes and he explains the whole thing. And it's, it's very, very, um, it's an amazing scene. And it really shows how things went down. And once you see that, it's really hard to backtrack and say, I don't think, <laughs> I think some strangers did it. No, you're not going to think that after the, after the fact. They got lucky that there were four different blood types. I mean, if they, you know, because that was, they were able to track everything. It's, it's absolutely amazing. So you got to check that out. You really have to check that out. Um, so let me go back down here now to the bottom. Oh, yes, that is correct. Red Rum says he objectified women. Yes, he did. That is exactly it. He, you know, he didn't really have those deep relationships he claimed he had. He wasn't really in love with these women. And his children, he very rarely even seemed to think about his kids at all. I mean, people said, oh, yeah, we came in and he always played with them and stuff like that. But they're toys at that point. But, you know, that he really cared about them and their futures and all of that and when they died it's like you know it's almost like they just you know gone on vacation someplace and so it was uh, really um mm -mm. um <laughs> yeah that molly he never stops talking especially about himself oh my god you know he wrote even after he he sued uh, joe mcginnis for for the book because he was pissed because he brought Joe McGinnis in thinking he could convince Joe McGinnis he was innocent. And Joe McGinnis had, at the beginning had no clue which way he was going, but he told, he told Jeff, Hey, I'm going to just tell the story the way I see it. And you know, don't, don't expect anything from me. But Joe, uh, Jeff being a psychopath, believe 100% that he could fool Joe McGinnis. And over time the f he failed to fool. And, so Joe McGinnis wrote the book as it is, and he got really pissed, and he actually did win some, win some money over that. But he spent a lot of time giving information to Joe McGinnis, but like you say, it was about Jeff, 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 and a lot about Jeff. Yep. Um, oh, it was, a, it was an interesting question. Why buy the pony? You know, the pony, the pony Elizabeth, really was something that was used a lot, even to the point where Jeffrey got upset and said, stop talking about the damn pony. It makes people throw up. <laughs> One time he was right. But there was a point to that. Um, so it's near Christmas, um, and he's got, he comes up with this real clever thing where he says, oh, there's one more thing for you, but you will have to take you to it. And he does this little ruse, and, and they end up at this place where the pony is. And you see him with the kids on the pony, and, 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 and immediately it makes you stop and think, what? What man who would buy his little girls a pony would then kill them a couple months later? Who would do that? How could this be true? Why would a man who's a psychopath buy a pony for his kids? Maybe it's just a, 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 a father who cares tremendously. Well, remember, he liked to do things in a grandiose fashion. He always liked to be the big honcho, the, big, the one you could point out to and say, look what he's done. For him to get a pony and pretend he's that kind of daddy, isn't is meaningless because you know who knows if, if, if the, you know he could decide to get rid of the pony and the heartbeat as well but he want you know that's the way he presents himself as being the great daddy um and remember that a great look at the other one chris coleman he was so good with the, taking his boys to baseball practice why would he take the boys to baseball practice and be a great coach and then kill his boys why would he do that 
I'll tell you why. Because it's a psychopath. <laughs> so just because a psychopath does something seems really cool, because we also, my family, my daughter also bought a horse, got a horse for my granddaughter, <laughs> and a whole bunch of other animals. And she's not a psychopath. But, you know, but a psychopath will do that because, hey, here's something. Here's what psychopaths do. Somebody says, you know, oh, you're going to have a farm? You ought to get a pony for your kids. And guess what psychopath will do? Two days later, he got a pony for his kids. Because now he's t somebody's told him that's what a caring dad who's going to get a farm would do for his kids. And then he just goes with it. So that's how they think. So don't buy, don't buy the pony makes me a great daddy story. You know. <laughs> um, let's see what else you have to say here. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, yes, um, this is true. Uh, this the club murder weapon that he claimed in the beginning was a baseball bat was purportedly a makeshift leg for one of the beds that was missing a leg. It wasn't actually missing a leg. I heard, I thought it was like one of the legs was like not hitting the ground properly. So they stuffed one under there to, to make it, make, you know, to balance, you know, to, to uh, stabilize it. I mean, we've all done that. I got furniture here that's got something st stuck under it. The paint job revealed drippings on the club leg itself and the base. Yeah. So the, unquestionably, the, the club came from the house. And so he couldn't get out of that one um, at all. Um, I don't know that I agree with that. See, that's what you're hearing from. That's what I just talked about, Lisa. Maybe you missed that point. That Ken Maines believed that when she was being attacked, the, the bed was j like jostled and the, 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 um, the blood, the, uh, the stick came out from under there, the piece of wood, and she grabbed it and tried to defend herself. And as I said, I don't believe that's true. I believe he got that thing. I don't know where it was, how he grabbed it, but I believe he brought that into the room to purposely bludgeon her. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that it was accidentally found. I think that was his intentional murder weapon. He was going to start with the bludgeoning, um, and knock her out. Um, so I don't, I, I personally think it was premeditated. See, that's where a lot of the theory comes that it wasn't a premeditated crime, that he went into a rage that while he was upset with her and he started hitting her, which he doesn't have any, he, has, he doesn't have damage to his hands. He's not punching the girl out. So he's got no, that kind of damage doesn't exist. So I don't think that it, they got into a fight and she hit him with a hairbrush and then he got mad at her and started punching her. And then she fell and the, 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 the bed moved and he, that, that piece of wood popped out and she grabbed it and tried to hit him. And then he grabbed that wood and beat her to death. That's all rage induced, not premeditated. And this is why, by the way, the jury gave on Colette second degree murder because they believe it was rage induced. They gave second on Kimberly because they believed that the story that he accidentally hit her. So he gave second on Kimberly. They gave third on Kristen, the little girl, because it was clear that she was in her bed when he attacked her and she was asleep. So she, he got first degree on that and that's what put him away. I don't believe that's true. I believe it was definitely first degree on Colette. I think it was premeditated. I think that the bludgeoning tool was planned. Um, and then once he bludgeoned her, he was also gonna stab her and did all the rest. At Kimberly, I can go with, it might have been accidental that she came in, daddy, 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 but I don't know that he accidentally hit her. I think she saw him killing her mother and he turned and he, he, he whacked her with it. That would be first degree as well. I think three first degrees. I'm with three first degrees all the way. Premeditated on Colette, quickly premeditated on Kimberly when she saw what was happening and he had to eliminate her as a witness and then just might as well get rid of the other kid. I'm going to go with three, three. Three murder ones on that. Um, what do you think of Colette going to class and asking about how her husband dealt with bedwetting? Eh, you know, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, they're probably both annoyed with it. But being annoyed with it and having two different versions of how you want to deal with it is not, in my opinion, going to end up in premeditated murder of this degree. It's just, I, I just think that, I think that's a red herring I, along with a Helena Stokely crap. I think, yes, maybe that was part of the th reasons he was annoyed. First of all, they didn't agree on that. It was another family issue. He, and he said to himself, Jesus, God, you know, how long do I have to put up with kids wetting the damn bed and allowing and, and having them in my mar marital bed? Why do they have to sleep in my bed to begin with? You know, my, my kids did. We had a family bed for four years. So, you know. My kids always slept in the bed, although they never peed in them. Okay, but anyway, 
But again, his point, he, he was aggravated and he had a good reason to be aggravated because if the child was bedwetting, she should not have been in the parent's bed. She should have been in her own bed on, you know, a plastic cover. And then she, you don't have to get mad at her. You can, you know, work with her in her own bed. But you say, because you're bedwetting, you can't be in our bed. You can come and visit us before bedtime, but then we're putting you in your bed. No, I think that's, I can see why he'd be annoyed. But I think he's more annoyed by the fact that he's going to have a baby and he's going to start this whole process all over again. And he wants a fancy life. He wants he wants hot women. He doesn't want a dowdy, three-time pregnant wife with a, probably her body isn't as good as it was. And she's got three kids to take care of, so she's always damn well tired. And she's going to maybe, I don't know if she was nursing her babies, but she's going to have to take care of the baby and the baby's going to cry. And this is his life for the next year, two, three. Hell no. If I could just get rid of them, I can have a good life. So that that's where I stand on that, and that's what I think. So, um, but you know, uh, that's my particular viewpoint on it, um, and how it all went down. I I strongly believe it's premeditated. I think he's a psychopath from the get go. I think he has severe problems with uh, his image and had to have everybody believe he was the best. I believe he considered women just objects. I believe he at some point just got fed up with having this family arrangement, especially when he finally got to the point where he was making enough money to not want to go to the farm, but want to be, to be living the high life. And she became an impediment and his children became an impediment and decided to remove them. Just like other, other men have annihilated their families to go on and have the freedom that they want. Uh, so that's, that's what, okay. This is the last question I'm going to answer here. And then I'm going to, um, uh, and, and this for today, why not just divorce her? Well, you know, people always ask this question, Steve, about all the ones that kill their wives and, ch and children. Divorce requires that, first of all, you have to go, you end up with court battles, you end up with lawyers, uh, you have sometimes alimony, but that's not as popular anymore. You end up with child support, you end up with having to deal with the custody issues back and forth, who's going to do that. You, got, you end up still being married and still being involved in this family relationship for the rest of your life. This is not freedom. This is responsibility. If you can get rid of the entire family overnight, as if they never happened, you get to move on and be free. You get to do whatever you want and your money stays with you and everybody, and the sympathies stay with you and the, you don't have to worry about, you know, what people think about you getting divorced. I mean, your family was murdered. Oh my God, you poor guy. It's freedom, you know, not having to play this game anymore. You're completely free. That's why you kill your family. Um, so thank you very much, Carrie. Compelling analysis of Jeff McDonald. Well, thank you very much. I hope it, I brought something different to, to, the, uh, to the arena because a lot of people have covered a lot of other things before, and I don't see the need to, to review those things. Joe McGinnis, fabulous book. Fatal Vision, fabulous show. Uh, Ken Maines really goes through a lot of the details of the crimes. I don't agree with his how it happened, but that's you know, that's just that's more a case of uh, you know trying to trying to figure out something you weren't there for. But I do I personally believe it was first degree murder and premeditated all the way. Um, so oh, thank you, thank you very much, Annie. I appreciate that. So this is this has been really great, and, and I'm glad you all came here today. This is this is the kind of um, chat room I want. Today was fabulous because since you're all uh, patrons of Patreon, um, that I had a peaceful chat room without a whole bunch of crazy people coming in, especially se since clearly I thought he was guilty and still think he's guilty. This is when you get the agenda people and we would have had, I don't know how many people come in and start saying he's innocent, 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 and it just becomes a big fat mess. So, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Molly, well, good. Thanks, Pat. Especially liked your readings. Thank you. I tried not to laugh through them, but I mean, and try to. <laughs> but the, some of them were kind of funny. Um, I click. Wow, what what a what a creepy dude. I mean, just seriously creepy dude. Most. Mo <laughs> Wait, thanks, sir. Uh, thank you very. Uh, thank you, Steve. I'm glad you enjoyed today, and you're welcome. And and Lisa says thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so. Um, so anyway, I wanted to bring something new to the table, which was, yes, he's guilty as hell, but why is he guilty as hell? What proves he's guilty as hell? What about his psychology? And what is the standout things to me in this particular case? And I hope I, those were interesting to you. And I say it was a very peaceful room today. And so for all of you who are coming here later, so this will go public 
Um, believe me, all my videos will always be public, so anybody can see my videos. But if you do want to participate in live, then please do join Patreon. Uh, levels three, four, and five, five dollars, seven dollars, and ten are you know you can participate in all of my lives, which are six lives a month. Um, but at five dollars, you can participate in them and uh, also support the channel. So that's why I'm doing that. So, um, but it's been very peaceful not to have all the other st stuff. So I want a better community, and I've had it today with the with my pa uh, my patrons here, who are great people and they're not crazy. <laughs> And Lisa says, nice angle on a much discussed case. Great group of people in chat. That's what I was aiming for. And, and again, if you, can, if, you, if you don't want to join Patreon, that's fine. Um, but you can always view my videos anyway. And you can always comment below. And what I tell people is that I stay here 30 minutes after the show so that you can comment below if you're, if you're, if you, if you're one of my patrons and you, you know, would like to talk further um, or if you missed the show but you want to talk a little bit, I will be here for 30 minutes after I put it public and just hang around and answer any comments that you have. So you kind of get first first place because you've seen the show already, so you already know what to talk about. So I'm going to still be hanging on, but I'm going to make it public as soon as we, we check out of here. So anyway, thank you guys for all of that. <laughs> Red Rum says, thank you. These tech blips are your signature. I, everything was fine all the way through the show, and all of a sudden, it's like, that's so annoying. So annoying. Oh, my God. Oh, thank you, Joe. Love to the UK and you as well. You know, you're one of my favorite guests. <laughs> so anyway, that, that'll be it. I'm going to make this, this public as soon as I have a... Okay, well, maybe a little, let's see if I can do a last... Let's see if I can do a last technical error here. <laughs> it's so much fun doing that. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so anyway, goodbye, everybody, and join me. Uh, if you're new to the show, please do just do like and subscribe. And... Uh, See what other sh uh, other um, videos I've got in the playlist and the case files. Covered a lot of territory so far. This has been one year here, so there's a lot of videos up there. So I'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Bye.